we really just got into looking into each other's eyes. I mean, tripping hard. <laughs> Hey everybody, your buddy Basil here, and you are listening to the Joy Spiracy Theory, where we take a lighthearted look into the lives and inner lives of listeners just like you. Uh, this week, I sat down and had a chat with Sean. Oh my gosh, guys, you are in for such a treat. This is uh, definitely just one of the trippier conversations I've had for a long time. Uh, Sean is just what a what a wonderful person he is, and uh, wow, some serious stories stories to tell. Um, I will say, uh, you know, maybe some slight viewer discretion advice. I feel like I, I've i given that before. I think you guys have come to uh, come to understand that that's just a part of the deal here, uh, but nothing too bad, so don't, don't worry. Um, but if you've ever wondered what, uh, what it's like to, oh, I don't know, be a professional skydiver or uh, an actual deal with the devil... Oh my gosh, I can't wait till you guys hear this. Um, anyways, it's it's going to be fantastic. But before that, why don't you head on over to Facebook and like the Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Joyspiracy Theory. Maybe that's where you found this episode. You're going to find a whole bunch of more cool stuff going on there. Uh, thank you so much to all the Patreon uh, the supporters. You guys are really keeping the lights on over here. Um, what else? What else? What else? iTunes. Leave iTunes review and rating. And, uh, 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 yeah, just do that. Do that. Oh, and even more, I will say, maybe some, if you're here, if you're listening to this because uh, a friend of yours sent you this podcast or told you about it, man, that just makes me so happy. And now it's your turn. Why don't you, uh, just share this episode? Trust me, this is going to be one you want to share. Share this episode. Send it to a couple of friends. Tell, tell uh, a friend about the podcast. Uh, they're going to thank you. You guys are going to be such better friends after that. You'll have so much to talk about. Trust me. Anyways, uh, let's get into this conversation with Sean. Truly, one of the we go a little bit off, uh, I, I guess, off format. You you would say, but I think you guys are going to enjoy it. It's one of the most uh, interesting and pleasant conversations I've had. Uh, doing any podcast really and those of you who listen to my other podcasts canary cry radio or canary cry news talk you know we have a lot of interesting conversations this one is this one is up there all right so uh, why don't you just uh, buckle your seat belts hold on to your butts um put on your shower caps and uh, get ready for this one guys okay here we go Hello. John, what's up, buddy? Hey, what's going on, man? Oh, not much. Just settling in. I got a cat staring deep into my eyes and it's freaking me out a little bit. But um, but other than that, I'm excited to be on the line with you. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, too. I've been waiting for this. This is like, this is like coming full circle. And man, I've never owned a cat. Never <laughs> liked cats. But I own a cat now. It hopped up on my lap at a men's meeting, just stared me in the eyes. It was a little itty bitty kitty, and I brought it home. We named him Shiloh because you know how things always turn out to be what their names are. Sure. So that is a place of tranquility. That's well, awesome. I left a bowl of grapes out, and that cat never gets into anything. And right now, this cat has been going nuts. Just waiting on you to call, and it knows that I'm not going to go get it out of the bowl of grapes right now. <laughs> That's adorable, man. I'm so happy to hear that. Oh, yeah. You, now you know the joys and the sorrows of, of cat ownership. Oh, man. Or, or cat it's, friendship, at least. Yeah, I have a cat friendship, definitely. <laughs> That's okay. awesome. So this cat just jumped up on your lap during a, a men's meeting or something, huh? Yep, men's Bible study. It chose you. It sure did. You've and been the guy chosen. Said, <laughs> yeah. And the guy said, go ahead and take him home. So I did. <laughs> wow. That's a, a, hey, if that's probably one of the best ways to get a cat that I can think of. And it, and it turned out to be one of those cats that are more like a puppy. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So it'll, it'll fight. It'll fetch. It'll, you just, you know, ah, ah, and then it'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's, <laughs> you know, that's awesome. You know, it sounds like that's the perfect cat for a, a non-cat man. It sure is. <laughs> well, I that's... lucked out. Well, uh, well, I gotta say that might be the most pleasant start to any of these podcasts that I've ever heard. Just start out with cat stories. That might yep. that might start a new trend. No, uh, you don't want to do that. Not all cats are cool. <laughs> well, I'm glad we got a convert. Uh, what are you grateful for today, buddy? Well, honestly, you know, I can go for the. I'm just so glad I get to cross over and walk into heaven with Jesus. Yeah, that's a good but, one. But, but beyond that, it's like uh, I've just I've got to praise God for my wife because I've been like five years going through surgeries, and if it wasn't for my wife, man, we'd ne- we'd never have made it. And she's been she's just been great through it all. Wow, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome, man. I gotta say, you know, in this day and age, being able to say uh, that you're that grateful for your spouse is is something special. <laughs> It sure feels like it. Yeah, amen. Well, okay, well, good. Well, you know, I just, you, you started right off talking about surgeries, so I, I'm kind of curious. What kind of <laughs> surgeries are you getting? Oh, man, I've had uh, I've had two knee surgeries, just the, the arthroscopes. I've had a total knee replacement. Um, I'm waiting on an ankle surgeon to let me know if I need surgery right now because right before – I was walking without a crutch from my knee surgery. I broke my ankle in three places. So that one's been a rough one. Oh, my gosh. I had my gallbladder removed. I've had kidney stone surgeries. Um, yeah, plural. Uh, I've had my C5 and C6 in my neck fused together. Uh, oh, my gosh. I, they're just slicing and dicing all over the place, man. Yeah. Got Nephilim DNA in me. <laughs> That's they're just trying to get to that sweet Nephilim marrow. They did. They took that that Nephilim paste and <laughs> pa- pasted it on my bones, and then now it's my bone. So they say, but you know. <laughs> Well, that's crazy, man. What? I mean, you you must have been living hard and fast. What's up with? I mean, your bunch of knee surgeries, ankle surgeries. What are you like a professional? Uh, I don't know. The, the, the <laughs> bungee jumper or something? That's one thing I wouldn't do, um, <laughs> just because of the way it jolts you around. Yeah. I would have. I would have done it in the beginning, but I beat myself up a lot growing up. You know, BMX, skateboarding. Um, skydiving rock climbing repelling all that kind of stuff oh so you're one of those exciting fellows huh yeah it was boring to watch football games i've gotten <laughs> used to it now but now i can kind of get excited at football games but yeah if it wasn't if it wasn't you know 120 180 miles an hour straight towards the ground i just couldn't pay attention <laughs> wow that's extreme dude that's pretty gnarly <laughs> it's been fun did you ever do any of it professionally or was it just a a a, a adrenaline hobbyist at first it was just for the adrenaline i was going through a divorce and was doing everything that you know i was never allowed to do but then uh i hooked up with some guys that were professionals in the x games and we actually lived in the bunkhouse with them and they trained me and they you know and it was up to you know the more skilled whether or not we could jump on a particular day they would always kind of wave me on like i was i was coming right along so i could jump and uh we started we started having a team wait so what for what sport are we talking about skydiving skydiving there's skydiving in the x games or they just happen to be x games athletes no they they used to be in the x games really i did not know that you could go back and look for like sky surfing and then what? there was there was freestyle um skydiving and then there was the you know the flat on your belly and you have to form so many positions in so much time you know before you got to fly away sure <laughs> that's, that's crazy what I, was training for. I had no idea that that was part of the x games yeah. why did they take it off the x games i think it's probably because there wasn't enough uh uh, sponsors oh yeah like, i don't know why people couldn't like, yeah. look at that just like they could you know bmx was, was that uh before the time of red bull or something because 
I mean, every no. every time I see a squirrel suit or a skydive or a base jump or anything, Red Bull's all over that guy's helmet. Yeah, Red Bull was did sponsor it there for a oh, while. There wasn't enough Red Bulls sponsoring it, huh? There might have not been enough people living through it. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's what I was gonna say too. I mean, that's like that's the, that's a pretty high consequence sport to be televising. Yeah, definitely. Wow. And that's that's probably a lot of you know why. Yeah. Because you got, you got to be pretty good to actually compete, and I mean, I had a long way to go, but. It was it was still something I was headed for. Holy smoke! So you were living with basically professional professional uh, 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 competitive skydivers, skydiving yep. with these guys, jumping out of planes, and probably uh, situations where it's maybe a little bit above your skill level technically, but you had you yeah. had your boys with you. Yep, that's extreme. Like, so what was your sport? Like, what was your your style? Were you doing it all, or did you? No, I was I was on my way at um at my hundredth jump. I started free flying, which is where you fly head down or feet down or in sit position, and uh, it's a lot of what you would see if you just pull up like free fly on YouTube. Interesting. That's what I was headed towards. But at about two hundred jumps, I got saved, and all of a sudden, you know. Do not test that the Lord your God kept coming into my head. And you know, I wanted to that that to be my area of witnessing or ministry. Right. And people don't they don't really you don't want to hear about God when you're getting ready to jump out of a plane. I was really surprised. But because really? I would pray. Yeah. So I would pray was, all the way up. Yeah, I was gonna say, so you would think that finding God and uh Praying all the way up would actually give you maybe a little bit of boost of confidence in the sport. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It was it was kind of the opposite for me. Like I wasn't afraid to die before I got saved. Right. And then once I got saved, I was thinking, you know, am I going to get in? The, like, am I only going to be able to push the peanut cart right up in front of heaven? You know, if I die because I was testing it or interesting. Was I going to get in all the way? I was, it was pretty wild. Well, that's it, that. It might be one of the most fascinating stories I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you'd think like uh, you know, I don't know. You hear it's uh, there's a lot of Christian athletes, and you know they're they're praying for God to protect them, and they give God the glory whenever they you know pull yeah. pull something off impressive. But you know, I will say this: I also have heard. I know a guy. Uh, pretty closely, who was a very good mountain climber and, um, you know, kind of got, I mean, he was, uh, he never went pro, but he was a, a very extreme mountain climber kind of in the 70s, which was kind of the, like, when mountain climbing became like, or rock climbing became, started getting popular and was still kind of fringy enough to be, you know, considered extreme. And, um, right. and then, yeah, he kind of just, Heard God say one time, it's like, nope, you're done doing this. <laughs> yeah, it's done. weird. Now, like, what do you think? Maybe because do you feel like maybe there was other plans for you or or what? Yeah, I, st- I, I kept thinking maybe skydiving would cut short anything God wanted me to do in my life. Right. Uh, I mean, before I got saved, I mean, I, I mean, this is probably later on in my story, but there was a morning that, and you might want to put that warning out like you did with Johnny Iron about the content. Okay, <laughs> yeah, sure. We'll we'll put a, a, a viewer discretion advice. Yeah, but I uh, there was one particular jump, and in a series of about three jumps, that finally sent me over the edge. I had uh, I had done about twelve hits of ecstasy the <laughs> night prior. <laughs> and we were so high, including the pilot. That's a lot and, of ecstasy, man. That's too much ecstasy. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. It but yeah, we took our last two hits at five thirty in the morning and decided we were too high to be on a plane at seven thirty in the morning. So we took uh we just took a cap full of GHB, you know the date rape jug. No? What in the world? Okay. 
Yeah, we each took a hit of the date rape drug to kind of help us come down a little bit, and it did. And uh, believe it or not, 7.30 in the morning, that pilot lifted that plane up, and his first flight, it seemed to go without a hitch. So then we all got on, and uh, me and my buddy, when we jumped, we really just got into looking into each other's eyes, I mean, tripping hard. And... uh, (laughs) just staring in each other's eyes and flying around it was unreal and all of a sudden i mean i think we both understood we forgot we were falling oh and oh my uh, gosh we had audible altimeters in our helmet and once we passed you know it's you got to figure out what you're doing now or it's going to be too late we, we could see it in his eyes the way they just got wide like <gasps> We're falling, and we, you know, we're falling past that 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 plateau, and we flew away from each other and pulled our chutes and made it down, and we actually came down a little bit, but yeah, it's like all of us on that plane. Wow, I mean, seven of us, are literally too high to even be in like society, let alone flying <laughs> a plane and jumping out of it. That's insane. Wait, was the pilot high too? Yeah, the pilot did his last two oh hits of pot too. Dude, that is the most extreme, dangerous thing I think I have ever heard. Yeah, one of the guys was one of the um, tandem instructors, too, where, you know, you get strapped to their parachute and you guys jump out together. And one of them was those guys. So if you ever want to go skydiving, I would I'd kind of get to know, you know, what they're – extracurricular activities are <laughs> and you know find out what their lifestyle is because there's a dark side of skydiving and you're hearing a little bit of yeah it right well, now. yeah well that was going to be my next question i mean is that kind of the uh the lifestyle that uh those professional skydivers were kind of participating in at the time was that a normal thing or were you guys kind of the the crazy ones of the bunch. I mean, you got to be um, a certain type of person to be a professional skydiver. It seems like you would be have a propensity for pushing things to the limit in a lot of different ways. Yeah, that's it's it's actually it's either that or the complete opposite. You know, the people that go to work every day. Actually, I even jumped with a rocket scientist at NASA, and most he would do is you know go get drunk after. But there's you have the totally normal side. You know, the mom, the grandma the, you know, that do it all day long. Sure. But then you have, you have that side that, you know, after the drinking slows everybody down, you're next to the fire. And then there's that group that starts, you know, and dove deep into some buzzes that, I mean, that particular night I put on a, a CD from Marilyn Manson. Oh, and yikes. as soon as it. Soon as I as soon as I did, one of them was like, "Who is this?" And when I said Marilyn Manson, a couple of them put their hands up like they knew something, and was like, "No, no, no!" But then that was too late. We couldn't speak. It was almost like there was a spell Whoa. that went out over that CD, and seven of us could not speak to each other for like how it was eighty four minutes or however long a CD is. And we tried. I mean, he was like. One of them would you know, put their hand up and get ready to say something, and then all you'd hear is Bleh. they just they just couldn't talk. Wow! And I was the first one to be able to talk because once the CD was just about over, I was like, "Guys, this this is insane!" And I was, oh, "I can talk, you know. Hey, can anybody else talk, you know?" And then after a little bit, someone else broke free. And but yeah, it was. Wow, it was, that's trippy, man. Yeah, there's a dark side to it all. Yeah, certainly. Wow. Led me, led me to Christ, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, talk about extremes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you guys drop just an enormous amount of ecstasy, be put under Marilyn Manson's spell, and then get in a plane flown by a guy who is coming down off ecstasy with uh, the date rape drug, and then yeah. skydive and almost miss your chance to pull the chute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I could see how a, an experience like that might lead you to uh, take a break from skydiving a little bit. Actually, I got suspended from skydiving. It was kind of like a, it was kind of like a skydiving DUI. Cause, uh, <laughs> That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't think so at the time, but 
looking for, back at it, that's kind of a that's a that's a badge. Yeah, <laughs> that's, kind of that's a, I don't. Not a lot of people can say that. Was that for that incident or for a different incident? No, I've, there was another time. Me and me and two buddies. One of them was a skydiver. One of them I just took skydiving just to help try to get him off a of coke, show him something different. But we had uh, we'd gone out in the field down in the cow patties in Florida. And uh, we turned our shirts into baskets and gathered a bunch of mushrooms, like not for salads. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we each had about a pound and wow. we did it like, yeah. That's, there a, was, that's a lot of mushrooms. Oh, man. We did it like a particular book. I don't want to advertise what book it is, but we did it like a particular book told us to do it to um, extract all of the psilocybin from the mushrooms and make it drinkable. And it was like drinking, you know, probably three shots of motor oil, used motor oil. And so each of us did about a pound of mushrooms. What? And, yeah. That's had, crazy. Now, I don't – look, I, I, I don't have – I'm not the most versed guy when it comes to uh, drugs – but I know enough to know that a pound of mushrooms is ludicrous. Yeah, it has to be like right next to dead. Yeah. And especially the kind of stuff that, you know, you're seeing. I came out of the shower and, and that skydive buddy of mine was like looking at a potholder hanging on the wall. And he's like, he's like, I'm not usually like this. And I'm just looking at him and I kind of staying out of swinging distance in case he, you know, came out of it and swung at me. And, right. and I was like, Hey man, what are you, you know, who are you talking to? And he's like, looks at the pot holder and he looks at me and he goes, you see, I'm, I'm like, I'm like him. I'm not usually like this. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? And then he's like snapped out of it. And then he pointed at the pot holder and he's like, do you see what I saw? I'm like, no, buddy, but we need to get together and help us, help each other through this. We need to connect here because we're yeah. on different channels. Yeah, it, it, that is probably the beginning of what sent me to Christ because uh, it had been a few days since I'd done any mushrooms. And uh, I smoked like a brooch, you know, just a little bit of a joint. Sure. And one morning I woke up with a cigarette – burned up should i be this far into this story oh no, yeah this is this is great <laughs> keep it going man uh, you know we're, this is how we roll we just whatever happens on the call is what happens we don't have to stick right. to any any sort all of right. format or anything all right well this this particular night you know nothing had gone on and then you know this might even be two nights later and i just smoked a roach and then i woke up in the morning with a cigarette in my hand and it had burned all the way down. So I put it in the ashtray and then I get up and I start to make some coffee. And then there was a knock at the door. When I opened the door, I recognized this dude from somewhere, but I just couldn't place it. And I just kind of nodded because I, I was, I was kind of running a bunkhouse myself. So people would come from everywhere in the world and they come, you know, with skydivers and they would stay in a bunkhouse so I, do, I just thought, you know, okay, this is another one of these guys. But he looked for something about him. And when I just kind of motioned for him to come in, he did. And he just went to the chair. He turned and looked at me and he said, are you sure, uh, are you, sure you want to do this? And all of a sudden it dawned on me. I was so distraught through my divorce. I actually consciously told God that I was not going to go seeking after him anymore. I was going after the other guy, you know, going down to the crossroads, you know, finding, you know, help, me, help me play guitar, you know, all that stuff. And I made the contract, you know, huge. Like, I'm, I don't want to just sell my soul to you and then, you know, die next year, you know, get all my stuff and die next year. I, you know, I want to live to 80 years old. I want to, I want, you know, I was, I wanted whoever my ex-wife with was with dead. Oh my gosh! I, I wanted, uh, I wanted, I wanted my kids back. I wanted to be able to play guitar. You know, it was a really, it was a strict contract, and I knew it. And uh, when he said, "You sure you want to do this?" That's when it dawned on me that, oh my gosh, this is, 
this is him. And as soon as I realized that, I blinked and I opened my eyes and I had a cigarette burnt all the way down in my hands. And so I put it in the ashtray and I got up kind of freaking like that was a bad dream. And I started making a cup of coffee. And then there was a knock on the door and I just thought, oh, no, did I like dream this because it's going to happen, you know, and I opened the door and same dude and he came in and it's like his face computer animate animatedly like morphed into someone that I've known somewhere. I just couldn't place it. And, you know, he asked, he asked me again, he's like, you sure you're ready to do this? And then blink, I wake up with a cigarette in my hand put it in the ashtray and I'm thinking twice now about fixing some coffee and and so I ended up wait that that happened twice oh no dude it happened way more than twice what you were in like a cycle of yeah and it went further each time what and this was all in a row this wasn't different days this was just this is every time I blinked once he was in there every time I blinked it started over what it went further and further until, you know, I'd always, I mean, I don't know, a lot of guys feel this way, but, you know, I wanted a blonde, a brunette, a redhead, you know, and I would like them all together if possible someday, right? Well, sure. Well, further on into these occurrences, you know, I'd blink, put the cigarette in the ashtray, start making coffee, knock on the door. I just opened it and let him in because I knew he was coming in anyway. There was no, there was no change in this unless somehow I changed it while it was going on. And so when he said, are you sure you want to do this? I just kind of waited and I didn't, you know, freak out. And I was just like, I don't know. And then he pointed towards the door and there was a knock on the door and I opened the door and then there was a blonde. And the blonde came in and put it, put her arm around this dude and just smiled at me. And he says, are you sure? Sure you want to do this now? And then blink happened again. You know, put that cigarette in the ashtray and start making coffee. And it goes further and further until um, I think it was the brunette. And then the brunette came in and then he had a girl on each side of his arm just looking at me, just like tantalizing me, saying, you know, this is it. This is real. You sure you want to do this? And my contract was very vivid in my mind. I knew what I was getting into. And I think this is the place that they talk about, you know, being the crossroads. It's not a place in Mississippi. It's literally a a place spiritually that you know, somehow the veil is lifted enough that you're seeing something that we wouldn't normally see. And God allowed it to be lifted enough to show me, you know, this stuff is real. You know, if you, you know, go your own way, whatever. Well, I blinked again, put the burnout cigarette in the ashtray and made the coffee, went through the whole knock on the door thing. And now when both of the females, the blonde and the brunette was, you know, on arms around him, he just looked at the door and I walked over towards the door and then this redhead opened the door. And when she opened the door, she came over and then she just like put her hand on my chest and she just kind of gently pushed me back and sat me in a chair. And then the blonde and the brunette came up and put their arms around me. Now it's done to get too x ray or anything. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they, they put their arms around me, almost to hold me in the chair, like something was getting ready to happen. And this redhead, like, opened this little wooden, uh, I get not a, it's not a cigar box. I mean, it was specifically for this thing that she had, this device. And she opened up this wooden case. And it, if you could picture like brass knuckles with syringes on each knuckle, oh my gosh. she put she put it on her hand and she just said, "Are you ready for this, honey?" And then I it was kind of freaked out because I was wondering, is this where it really happens? And then, and then she said, "Most people come back a little tan from this, but you'll be okay." And then she raised her arms back. I raised her arm back, and I looked at that dude, and he was just smiling, some wicked smile. And I looked back at her, and as she plunged this thing into my chest, 
I woke up again, cigarette burnt down in my hand. And I was like, there is no way I'm doing this the same. I put the cigarette in the ashtray. I walked over and it's like, you know, I'll, get, I'll grab a Coke. I didn't want any coffee at this point. And it didn't matter because as I'm walking past the door, I hadn't even made coffee on this one, but there was a knock at the door. And I was like, get out of here. I'm not letting you in this time. You, you know, you're not, I don't want this. And, you know, and I just kept hearing these like voices. It's too late. It's done. It's done. You already, you know, we're, you're already in basically you know, like Jim Morrison. Oh, are you in? Yeah. That's what happened to me. Wow. But, uh, but I didn't let him in this time. And then in a flash of like horror, I noticed my window was open and I was afraid he was just going to come get around the place and come in the window. So I, I darted off towards the window. And when I got to the window and started to close it, my skydive buddy peeked around, you know, and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, sorry, dude, you're not getting in here. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you know, your face is going to change when you come in here. I know this whole thing. I'm not letting you in. And he said, dude, let them in, you know, and there were my other two team members. And they finally convinced me that what I was experiencing was real. And they're like, we have been trying to get you out of here for a week. So, what? so that whole thing that I was going through had been going on for a week. And somehow... I don't even, how do you even live? You know, ain't it supposed to be so many days without food and you can die? Yeah. I, wow. I know I was drinking fluids through this whole time, but I, I don't, I never remember eating. And they said it was a week. And That's I admit, crazy. I, I, missed, I had missed the X Games trials. And uh, so I like failed my team. And, uh, one night when I was drinking, I was just shared, you know, do you ever, you ever wonder what it would be like just to, just to just fly right in and, you know, basically bounce. And someone told one of the owners that I had talked like that. You, know, you mean, knew, you mean like not pulling your chute and yeah. bouncing off the ground? Yeah. Cause most people, they, they bounce like 18 feet. Oh, if they, if their chute doesn't deploy. Yeah. And some of them had even planned it and like, like flew in at, you know, an angle it's called tracking. You know, you track away from each other before you pull your chute. One, you know, one guy even he like tracked towards the runway. So when he hit the runway, he actually like, he, he skidded into nothing. You know, he oh, didn't really bounce. But... So, you know, having had that kind of thing happen before people lose their mind and can just do that. That's how I got, that's how I got suspended. I had to see a counselor and, you know, convince them I'm not really suicidal. I just, you know, I just said, man, you ever wonder. And I had to prove to these guys I wasn't suicidal before I could jump again. That's, but, wow, man. I mean, so you were, you were really in a place there. I mean, I've never heard a story like that one uh, that you told. And then, yeah, I mean, I got to say, I, you know, I, I'm not here to shut down anybody's skydiving career, but, uh, <laughs> sounds like, yeah, might've been time for a little break there, buddy. Yeah, actually I drove down, I think it was, it was the, it's the highway that goes down by Cape Canaveral goes down that coast. Um, I was driving down there to church, to church, to church, just trying to find a pastor or somebody, you know, a father or whatever that I could talk to to find out if I was crazy. And it took me like four hours. And I finally found a church that this guy, you know, this pastor would talk to me and I told him the story. And he's like, you think if I took all that stuff, I'd see that stuff too. And I was like, you'd probably go straight to demon bill. I mean, I know because I mean, the night that we were all doing the ecstasy before we all got on the plane and the GHB and stuff, we uh, we hallucinated when we couldn't speak. I watched this cowboy float into the room, like for just from the waist up, he floated in, and it looked like he would have been walking if he had legs. 
but he, he like, this is where the pastor is like, you kidding me? This stuff really, you saw this stuff. Um, this cowboy like turned and pulled out his gun and lowered his gun at the pilot. And right when I saw that, I saw this like shadow thing. It was almost like jail come up from the ground right in front of him and just somewhere i mean it was it's it was almost audibly i heard don't let them know you see them and as soon as i heard that 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 black gel looking thing crawling up his legs as soon as he got ready to touch him like grab his leg he turned and looked at me and i just moved my eyeballs not my whole head just my eyes to make it look like i, I couldn't see him so wait, the the black goo is climbing up whose leg? The the cowboys the pilots, or the, the pilots. pilots? Okay. Yeah, and then when the the cowboy pulled the trigger on the gun, that is when the black thing grabbed a hold of his leg, and the, the pilot made this sound. You know, uh, uh, I mean, it was the weirdest sound, almost orgasmic, and. As soon as that happened, I was, you know, I kept trying to want to break free, like something's going on here. Well, once we all could speak, we went out and sat by the fire, and then we drank the GHB and calmed down quite a bit. We were going to go to another buddy's house, another skydiver's house. And about, you know, 5.30, 6.30, something like that. Sun, sun still had a little ways before it came up. We were, uh, we were walking down the street, all seven of us. And all seven of us came to a stop, and I saw, I, I didn't know why they were stopping, but I know why I was stopping. I saw, like, a 17-foot gator, like it was crossing the street, just from, you know, one, uh, I don't know whether it's the cemetery or if it's going towards the cemetery from the skydive place. But uh, we all live that close. You There's a walk. cemetery right next to the skydive place? Yeah, it's I've landed little, in it before. It's a little disconcerting. I, when I landed in it, I this was way off of the story I was talking about, but when I was landed in it, um, kind of fitting. I had no shoes on, no shirt on. First of all, like free fly, just, a, just as free as I could be. And I missed the drop zone the wind was off and as i was trying to land in the cemetery i was yelling look out look out you know i know everybody were looking around they couldn't see me and i finally was like look up <laughs> and they looked up and saw me and i missed a couple of their heads and i jumped over a tombstone and and it's like slid in and hit another tombstone and I, I was still good i didn't hurt anything. oh my god but yeah there's a cemetery close but <laughs> oh my god Back to this gator, this gator that was crossing the street. I looked at the other guys, and they were looking at the same thing I was looking at. So I knew they, they had to see this thing, too. And I walked a little closer because the thing wasn't moving. It's just like moving its head, looking at us. And you know, every once in a while, the tail would move a little bit. And I walk a little bit closer, which shows I was on drugs. Why would you walk towards <laughs> But I got a little closer and the thing got smaller. And then I went a little closer and the thing got smaller. And when I went a little closer, one of the guys is like, stop, because he knew I was walking right into this thing. And once I got up to it, it was actually just the shadow of a street light pole in the street. And I stood up like, oh, my gosh, and just started walking. And one guy freaked out, but then he saw I walked right through this thing and then they all started walking and we almost didn't say anything. And I, and I just said, I just want to know this. How long was that thing? How big was that thing? And then one of the guys said, Oh man, that was every bit of 18 foot. I've never seen a gator like that. And I was like, what? Oh, so everybody saw the same thing. Yes. And so, and reptile at that, we all saw a reptile. And so that's the night I figured, okay, hallucinations, I don't think they're really hallucinations. I think people are actually participating. Tuning in. in. Some, yeah, exactly. Right. And so that cowboy and that black thing, when I saw one of my hallucinations interact with my friend and my friend react to it, that was it for me. I knew this. Was, so as I'm telling the pastor all this stuff, 
he's just like, so I can take drugs and you think I'd see this? And I was like, oh man, you go straight to Demonville. I'm sure of it. I mean, as close as you are to God, and I, was like, I hope you are your pastor. And, you know, heck yeah, you, you just, you just tune right into Demonville. There would be no seduction for you. And so I just, I told him my story. I was crying, you know, and I was like, I'm, I'm away from my kids. I got this promotion. We were all supposed to move down here. And then my ex-wife just didn't move down. She, she stayed. So, you know, she had just had a death in her family and had seen some people she hadn't seen in a while. And I, I thought maybe she had had an affair with, you know, someone with the emotions of someone dying and right. being, being close to somebody you haven't been close to in a while. I figured it had happened, but I wasn't sure. But right before we were supposed to sign on a house, she just, you know, I just knew something was wrong. And when I called her, you know, like, no, what's the matter? And she just like, just don't, you know, don't worry. And I was like, no, what's the matter? And she goes, I just can't. And I'm like, you, you're saying you're not coming down here. And she's just like, Sean, I can't. And basically prevented us from signing on a house down there. And that's what sent me into this downward spiral was just you know, doing whatever. Wow. You know, drinking. I know I drank enough to kill myself. I don't know why I never did. And I drove too, which was even weirder and never got caught. And so as I'm telling this pastor this, it's like, you know, should I go see a psychiatrist? You know, is all this stuff real? And he said, I think God has lifted a veil for you to see this stuff. And he wanted it to stick. He wants you to know that it's real and he wants you to choose him. And you need to move back to Ohio and be there for your boys when they go through the same thing. Oh, because, geez. Yep they're going to do the same thing and they're going to go into this and you need to be there to be able to explain to them how real it is, you know? So when they see it, they'll believe it. And sure enough, you know, I went, I came back to Ohio and it's like Satan put this girl across the street that did cocaine and got, she was a pharmacy tech. So even one of her friends, you know, would have like thousands of Percocets and Vicodin and stuff in her. Oh boy. In her trunk. Yeah. So Satan really, and to boot, her, uh, her husband was a psychiatrist. So whatever I didn't have or I needed, he could write me a script for it. And so that kept, that kept me pretty, uh, that kept me pretty distracted for about a year. Pretty doped up there. Yeah. In fact, I was, I was to the point of making the decision. I was going to drive down with the, with the Coke dealer. I was going to go down and pick up a Jeep from uh i forget where it was maybe new mexico or something like that and it was packed full of packed full of pot and cocaine and i would get fifteen thousand dollars and a kilo of coke when i got home if we just got it back here and right before we did this um that girl's friend she got arrested and had like twenty seven thousand felony counts that she was facing for all the Percocet and Viking and all oh, stuff. Oh, because of like one for each pill or something? Yep. So oh my gosh, that's crazy. I know. And then the girl, she uh, she went to live with her mom or something for a while. And, and I stayed with my mom. And somehow my aunt talked me into going to this send, send, send us the promise or something like that. It was, a, it was an Easter play in 2001. And actually, no, I take that back. It had been 2002. And uh, I kept saying no because I knew I just, I couldn't, the withdrawal from morphine was just too horrendous. I just couldn't go. And uh, I finally went this one time. I was, I had taken way too much morphine the night before and I'd done coke with it. And it's like my heart was beating so fast and so hard. I knew something was wrong. And I was, I was like beat red. I had a temperature of like 104, 105. And I knew this was probably it. I'd already done it. And so it was the first honest prayer I'd ever said. I just said, Lord, I know I'm going to, finish that bottle of morphine but please 
don't let my mom or my brother find me dead in here. Just get me through this and I'll finish the bottle of morphine and I'll call Aunt Linda, you know, and I'd go to this play, this Jesus play, you know, the Easter play. And that's what I did. I made it through that night. A cold shower and just calm myself down and just the honest prayer to God. You know, usually it's, oh God, if you get me out of this one, I'll never do it again. I was like, no, <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm going to finish my morphine. That's just all there is to it. And I'm sorry, but just please don't, don't let it be like, don't let it end like this. And so I went to the Easter play and man, something, something just, some clicked. And it wasn't necessarily the altar call. It wasn't necessarily any of that. But I said every prayer of repentance I could think of. And so even though I knew I was saved, I still just, I didn't feel like completely saved. I felt like I still had this, I still had this thing that stuck to me and I wasn't going to get into heaven like this. And about a year later, I met some friends from a different church and, and I always said, I just want to go be Amish. I want to get off all the drugs. I want to get away from all the TV, get away from all the the girls and the skydiving. And the, just, I just want to get away and go be Amish, you know, calm down to nothing. <laughs> and what ended up happening is uh, my best friend now for 10 years is a pastor who comes from a Mennonite background. And he left the Mennonite church because rather than just protect their own, he wanted to go spread the word, spread the gospel. And it ended up reaching me. And so this Mennonite background, you know, owns his own business, you know, builds houses, doesn't take money from the church, kind of pastor, befriended me. And like, you know, don't you know who I am? You know, you know, he gave me the codes to his house, you know, hey, go check the bunny and the kitty, make sure they have food and go to every window in the, in the house, make sure nobody's tried to come in. Like, don't you realize, you know, earlier on in my story, I was facing, before I went to Florida, of course, I met my ex-wife. I was in treatment for like four months, drug treatment, because uh, I woke up in somebody's basement and he had opened a door in between the basements and said hey come look at the other place and see if you want to rent it so we did him his wife and two kids we went over there i looked at it and i'm like yep and i'm all soma out i don't know if you know what somas are but oh yeah so, okay well i probably seven deep in somas and uh i just went back and laid back down next thing i know i'm being arrested for going over there you know uh what since since it was yeah since it was after 6.30 at night, it was considered aggravated, and they called it burglary. And it turned out the landlord's son was a cop, and he, they thought they saw evidence that someone came in, so they arrested us. And when they did, they were like, you know what? There's nothing to hold these guys with. They didn't do nothing. You can, there's not, the family doesn't even live there anymore. They were evicted. And so they let us go. But enough happened in that household that I had to, I had to move out. And when I did, the wife took a bunch of my stuff and threw it somewhere and it was in a no dumping zone, but it had envelopes of the address that I was staying at now. And it turned out I had been subpoenaed to go to court oh, and no. never went because I never got the subpoena. But when uh, they showed up at my house, my brother you know, said he's not here, but you know, I can get him the message. <laughs> and he gave me the message that a detective was looking for me. He gave me the number to call. And when I called, I had a bag of volumes. I had a bag of lore tabs, painkillers. I had drank almost a pint of whiskey, was playing guitar. And the detective that I called wasn't in. And I gave him the number that he could reach me back at. Well, they traced that number and then there were seven sheriffs showed up and they picked me up. And that's how I found out that I was supposed to have gone to court. So while I was in jail, it took me, I guess it was three months before I found out actually what was going on. So I was in Franklin County jail for like three months. And then when I got out, I went straight into treatment and then it went from aggravated burglary to burglary to B&E. And I still didn't want to. 
I was like, I trespassed. That's all I did. You know, I'm it, not guilty of this. Well, didn't the didn't I thought the guy told you to go hang out at his house and feed his cats and stuff. No, no, no. That's the pastor. Oh. See, see this, this story I'm telling you about now is why I was telling the pastor. Don't uh, you know who I am? Got it. Got it. Because I had all of the, I had, I faced these charges five to 25 years in jail. Oh my gosh. And just for waking up on Selma's, going into the neighbor's basement that were evicted and came back in and lay back down and passed out. That's all this, all that happened. Right. And I, I didn't want to play guilty to any of it. I said, I plead guilty to trespassing. And the guy's like, look, I know you didn't do it, but you either plea bargain to breaking and entering or you go to jail for five to 25 years. And he was like, if you just plead guilty to B and E, you will walk You'll be on probation. And so that's what I did. And so when I, you know, when I met these, these guys, where I am now, the pastor that let me have coach to his house. That's why I was like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know, you know, what society calls me? And, and he's, and he asked me, he said, uh, you know how you get, you know, how you, how you get to trust somebody. And I was like, no, how? And he said, trust them with something. And so that was the first thing I'd been trusted with. And I can't even remember how long. And so it was my first, you know, as a Christian, you know, a year after being a Christian, that I wasn't feeling so dirty still, you know, that I could still go to hell, you know, thinking I'm a saved, but still scared of hell at the same time. And, you know, still have this thing that I think society looks at me like, but this guy, this guy broke that for me. And when I was telling him every sinner's prayer, I could, you know, every altar I could go down to every, you know, money grubbing televangelist on TV that I, you know, these, you, you know, send your thousand dollar seed and, you know, your prayers will be answered. Right. I just asked him, I was like, you know, I sold my soul to the devil. How am I going to get into heaven like that? And he just said, you know what, man, it wasn't yours to sell in the first place. And all of a sudden it was like this weight came off of me. And it's like, I never had to pray, pray another sinner's prayer again. I didn't. I mean, just that guy said, <laughs> Just that guy saying something as simple as your soul was not yours to sell. Wow. Took the weight off of me to where I was. I knew then I was going to heaven. I didn't know when, I didn't know how, but like that's the first time that I ever truly felt like all that weight. It's gone. You know, it's like I used to, I used to play with demons for fun, you know. That was my extracurricular activity. <laughs> Ouija boards as a kid, seances, stuff moving. My brother had a pepperoni fly across the room and hit him directly on the nose. I mean, we had a bunch of stuff happen, you know, stuff moving. It's just uh, voices talking to us, sleep paralysis, you name it. From the time I was 12 years old, it's like I'm, that was my life, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, trying to reach the other side and could never quite retain any of the information I ever got from the other side. And now here I am a Christian and every experience I've had, I remember it vividly, any spiritual, you know, deep prayerful understanding of the way the world is, you know, it, it, it's, I retain it now. It's not like those, you know, pound of mushrooms where you can figure out why one particular grain of sand is where it is on the earth and you know, how it got there. I mean, once you get past that, you can't even write it down to retain the information. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it was always it was always a perverted, you know, it was a perverted knowledge. You never really got to keep all of it. You just kept the parts that make you look crazy when you tell people the story about it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which is my number one thing. Like what what's a word you would you would use to describe yourself? Are you asking me? I'm asking you. <laughs> Number one word to describe myself. Uh, let's see. I would say um, complicated. Hey, that is awesome. Thanks. Because mine was misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, wow. Complicated. I like that. Yeah. I was just trying to sound cool. 
Well, hey, it was cool enough that I think I might dub myself complicated now. <laughs> it's a good one. Try it out sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, misunderstood so, though. Yeah, I mean, I that, it totally makes sense, man. And you know, yeah. I I want to. I actually, you're doing great. Just go, doing telling your story here. I'm very much enjoying it. But from what I gather, it's uh, you know, you, your whole life you've been having these experiences and. Somehow, and I'd be curious if you have any insight to maybe why that's such a theme in your life, and perhaps like a lot of the drug use and the the adrenaline junkiness and things like that might be in response to maybe some experiences that you had as a kid, maybe trying to figure yeah. it out or something like that. Well, are you asking the question why my life went that way? You know, I'm just putting it out there. And just right. seeing seeing if you got an answer for it. I kind of do. I mean, you I know, hate to. I gotta say, it. you're one of these guys. I don't really need to like lead this. You're doing a great job yourself. <laughs> well, thank you. You're I was scared to death when you called. <laughs> I know you kept saying how nervous you were, and uh, you know that I like to tell people just it's, it's we're just having a chat, and that's exactly what this is. I feel like uh, I feel like you're just t- telling me your story, and it's amazing. So please just keep going in whatever way. But yeah, I, I do. Uh, I do wonder that because, you know, the 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 steps we take in our adult life, I I find, and I'm not some revolutionary for thinking this, but uh, you know, often stem from some motivation we have as a child. Yeah, um, we left my dad when he was 11, and I thought. You know, we were leaving him, I, you know, so I didn't know. So I automatically rebelled and started smoking pot. And, and, you know, early on I had a babysitter that taught me some things that maybe I shouldn't be taught, you know, that's eight years old. So right there I have drugs. Uh, I'm going into my teens with sex already. Um, and so... You know, naturally, the next step is, you know, what's beyond, you know, can I make something move with my mind and, you know, try to do all kinds of stuff. But then we started with the Ouija board Uh and seances and we had a bunch of stuff happen. I mean, my my oldest sister, she's younger than me, but when she'd come home from school, she would sit outside until one until another one of us came home because the stuff that happened in our house was just so insane. She couldn't. She, she couldn't go in it by herself. And, you know, I, when I was 14, 15, I was doing seances at this cemetery called Willie Burgers. And, uh, we found out why it's Willie Burgers. There's a William Booker or Butcher and him and his wife and like three babies are all buried in the same place. And we go out there and we'd have seances and, We'd get scared out of there like we were chased out of there by dogs one time. And as soon as we got to the chain on the driveway, we hopped over the chain. It's like the dogs just looked at us and turned away and walked down into the woods. And Whoa. Another, another time we were chased out of there by a hearse. And another time, and this is all in the middle of the night. Another time there was a bunch of guys in hooded outfits that chased us out of there. We knew there was satanic worship going on there, but. You know, they, they didn't even want you in the cemetery and they would chase us out and we get to the end and then the hoods would go down into the woods. I mean, it was pretty scary. It was fun, but it was scary. Yeah. But uh, my mom was telling people at work, you know, yeah, my son goes to Willie Burgers. You know, that must be a good burger joint because they seem to want to go there every weekend. And, and one of the people she told us, no, that's a cemetery they call Willie Burgers. And she told my dad, And my dad flew up to Ohio from Florida to have a talk with me about these seances and what I, what I was doing. And he said, I know you're probably going to keep going on this, but I got to let you know when you get in too deep and you know, something evil is around you. You say, cast away all evil spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. Really? Yeah. My dad had never talk like that before i guess he grew up methodist but um it turns out the reason we left him is because he was gay he had an affair when i was 11 
and like they, there was a couple that they went to the Bahamas with and they came back and then him and the guy went somewhere and had an affair and it came back, you know, and we left. And I didn't know that till I was 24, but he came back and told me, you know, if you're going to have seances, you know, cast, cast all the evil spirits away in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and he said, I've been to that cemetery, you know, 20 years ago, I went to that cemetery and had seances. And he told me about his experiences where they would go in, the candle would blow out, they'd go back in there, write down what they smelled, felt, heard, saw, you know, that kind of stuff, compare notes. And the third night they were there, their numbers were shrinking, you know, started out 12 or 14, but their number, numbers shrunk down into like six or eight. And on the third night, um, the candle kept going out, but they heard organ music. They smelled flowers like in a funeral home. And then they heard footsteps coming down the hill in the, in the leaves. And right when the footsteps got close to them, the, uh, the, the, this girl sitting Indian style, pinkies linked and everything, this girl just freaked out and started screaming. And so they all took off and, they got back to the car and realized this girl's still up there screaming. So they had to go pick her up, sit in Indian style, carry, carry her back to the car and then throw her into the car and drive away. Oh my gosh. Brought her to the apartment and she screamed all the way into the apartment and she screamed in the room until finally she calmed down and she laid down and everybody wrote down what they saw her small, uh, saw, heard, smelled, felt, you know, and it was all, like six out of the eight were to a T the same. And this girl started screaming again. And when they busted in the room to try to help her, she sat up and actually she was taking a huge breath in. I guess there was this entity that was coming out of her mouth, floated around the room and then took off out the window. And every night they go to the coffee shop and talk to this priestess, you know, uh, well, well, don't know what you call her, but she would interpret everything that they were dealing with, you know, in some witchy witchcraft kind of, you know, all knowing, trust me kind of way. And told her what was going on, that they made contact. And by this girl screaming, that was her subconscious fighting with everything she had not to be possessed by this thing. Wow. And it finally left just, you know, well, for one, God didn't allow it, but or two, you know, she just, just something in her fought the entire time. And so they went back down on the fourth night. There were six of them. And this time they brought a lantern so the candle wouldn't blow out. And when they walked through the cemetery gates, there was this big old oak branch that just fell right in front of them, right before they could even walk up into the cemetery. And when it did, they looked at each other like, okay, that's nature. It could happen, you know but it scared the crap out of them. And, uh, and then they stepped over this huge limb and started to walk up into the cemetery. And I guess there was this old black lady and like civil war garb, you know, like she would have been a, 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 a maid or whatever, mm -hmm. walked up and says, y'all don't want to go into this place. There's something evil's here. And then when they, you know, she walked down into the woods and they're like, oh man, we are really getting close to contact or something. And then once they all finally stepped over the log and started walking up into the cemetery, uh, it's like once that, once that, that old maid was gone, the glass and the lantern shattered. So there's no way they're going to be able to use it for light. So that's the night they just took off. And that was the last night ever. Oh my. So that's what. That's why my dad came and talked to me, you know, flew 1,500 miles to talk to me about seances because he knew I was in the same cemetery doing the same thing when he was, you know, he was 20 something and I was 14, 15 years old. And he yeah. knew. You were young, was, man. You needed a talking yeah. to is what it was. Yep. He knew what I was after too. And he knew what I was in for, but he didn't tell me about the seven sons of Skiba, you know, if you use Jesus name and you don't even have him, you know, these things can lump on you. Yeah. yeah. Holy Glad smokes. I found that out later. <laughs> so, 
So you had these experiences. You, you you were interested enough to try to get involved with these seances in the graveyard, and you were having stuff. I mean, was there? Do you remember like a first something that happened, or it kind of sounds like you know your dad was into it, and maybe something yeah. kind of stemmed from that and kind of came down the generations or something or do you, do you yes. remember like a first event that really uh is stuck in your mind yeah first one i was 14 or 15 and the tv came on and it went to snow yeah and uh i went to turn the channel and it's just the same channel just nothing but snow yeah and uh then I tried to turn it off and it wouldn't go off. And so I went to unplug it and realized it wasn't even plugged in. And I freaked out. And as soon as I freaked out, it went off. Wow. That was probably, that was probably my first experience. Yeah. That's a freaky one. You know, what's crazy is, and I don't know if I've ever shared this on the show, but I had similar experiences to that when I was a kid. Um, You know, I was one of the cool kids who had a TV in his bedroom. Yeah. And there was a period of time there where, uh, now, thankfully, nothing like this has happened for a long time. And listeners, and I'm sure you know that I have experienced uh, a lot of things with uh, sleep paralysis and things like that. Thank God nothing crazy has happened in the maybe the past five years. So, so that's uh, so that's good news. Um, but, yeah, man, being a young kid, I was, uh, yeah, maybe around that time, 12, 12 to I would say around 12. Yeah. Um, big old TV in my room. It was the old TV that was in the living room. And they got a new TV, so I got the big TV. I was super pumped, and yeah, in the <laughs> middle of the night, man. And this would happen. Oh, countless times this happened. It would just turn on in the middle of the night, full blast volume to static, yeah. you know, on snow and changing channels, turning off. Nothing worked. Had to unplug it. And uh, I, I don't remember it ever staying on after I unplugged it, but man, was I freaked out because it would happen in the middle of the night. I'd be dead asleep. Yeah. Three o'clock. Three. Yes, exactly. You know, I, I don't think I had the wherewithal to actually check the time. But looking back, it had to be around three because it was like dead of night. Um, yeah. And, and I, I remember I had stuff flying across my room. I had uh, yeah. a couple times where I woke up to uh, my bed just shaking like violently shaking and then the next morning i would you know be talking to my friends or my parents like you guys feel that earthquake last night They're like yeah. there was no earthquake what are you talking about um yeah. and interestingly enough and i don't think i've shared this with anybody uh interestingly enough all this stuff was happening i would wake up with uh, spiders all over my body and I would like run into my parents house or my parents room and like tell them there's spiders all over me and then there were no spiders and all stuff like that um, or there would just be like one spider whereas you know when I was in my bed they're all over me and then I'd run in and then there would just be like one it was really weird and then uh, later on I remember I was much older um, you know maybe I was 15, 16 something like that and uh, I was walking by my bedroom door and I just caught the light was just right. And by this time, all that stuff had stopped happening. You know, all stuff flying around, uh, right. the TV thing, everything had stopped happening a couple of years later. And I was pat walking by my door and the, the light was hitting it just so that I could tell that it must have been my mom or my dad or something. They had... Uh, anointed the door with oil in the shape of a cross and they must have wow. done that and i just never noticed it um but i i guess they noticed something bad was going on so they took care of the problem thanks mom and dad yeah definitely i wish i'd had a little more of that <laughs> my, my mom was busy trying to graze four kids by herself and so i could see her not you know she, she used to walk to a catholic church when she was younger and so she knew about God mm -hmm. and I went to a Catholic church when I was like third grade or whatever. And I was made to go to catechism and you know, that all sucked. So <laughs> I wasn't really into God all that much that way. I wanted to find God a different way. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of my life was trying to find him through doorways that he didn't want to be found through. You know, there were other things there and I didn't, in fact, 
you know, after all my sleep paralysis, which brought up sleep paralysis, that used to be the main thing through all my experiences, you know, doors shutting, opening and shutting, uh, entities walking up the stairs and then walking right by my room and there nothing be there. Uh, just some terrifying things like all the cupboards. My mom used to yell at us for leaving all the cupboards open and, you know, all the cupboards would just start bam, 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 bam. Wow. I thought, you know, thought it was my mom, but no, it's not my mom. And, and there was another time the fireplace was on and I don't think we actually had a fire burning, but for some reason, the gas in the fireplace was ignited and it had flames like a foot and a half feet, feet, feet tall and and it would not turn off at the gas main, you know, fireplaces have a little gas thing. Yeah, sure. It would not turn off. And she even called a plumber. Oh, gosh. And a plumber came and could not shut it off. So he had to cut the pipe and cap it to keep it from, from just burning. I mean, it was, it was, that was the kind of weird stuff we had growing up. Yeah. Wow. My yeah. brothers and sisters were in Florida one time and I had already moved out and my mom thought I had come home because she heard all the cupboard doors slamming and she came downstairs and realized it's all pitch black down there. And, you know, I wasn't there. And so she, you know, went back up to bed, kind of spooked. And then she heard the basement door opening and closing. And she went downstairs and found out I wasn't anywhere to be found. So she stuck a knife in the molding in between the molding and the door to keep it from opening and closing. <laughs> So yeah, we had a lot of stuff like that, but the sleep paralysis is probably what really had, you know, oh man, that hacked me off bad. That was some, that's some terrifying stuff. But uh, I used to get drawn by this. My little brother used to think, you yeah, know, you're just making up all these stories, but each one of them had sleep paralysis too. Yeah. And some Sometimes we would see scenes of a day that may have passed in the house that we were that we lived in but it was like way before but um i would have this little like troll lady standing just about at my shoulder and she would be like vibrating and glitching in and out like she was a hologram oh gosh she seemed very powerful for some reason and she would always drag me off the couch and drag me down the stairs towards the sump pump what physically Yes. You physically then, dragged by glitchy witch lady. Yep. And then once I would get there, you know, I remember cast away all evil spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. And then everything would go in like a high speed reverse. Like I was, you know, you rewind a VHS tape and it would just knock me back up on the couch, panting and just freaking out. And what? Yeah, it was crazy. Oh and my one, gosh. One time she pulled me off the couch. See, I mean, there's another thing. My brother's like, nah, nah, nah that stuff's not really happening. You know, you're on drugs. Well, I wasn't on those kind of drugs at this point, but um, he looked it up online and found out there was this old hag syndrome and it was accompanied by sleep paralysis. Oh, and, you know, I've actually heard that. Okay. Well, before, before the internet was even on, it was happening to me. Wow. Oh my and, gosh. Okay, I just gave away my age a little bit. Probably. <laughs> That's okay. But, uh, then uh, one time she was carrying me or dragging me downstairs towards the sump pump, just like like that sump pump was some sort of portal or something. I don't know. I just yeah, I wonder the why the sump. Some... Now, excuse me, I'm I'm a California boy. What the heck is mm -hmm. a sump pump? In the basement, there'll be a hole in the basement. So when the water table comes up, and instead of your basement just kind of flooding. Uh -huh. The sump pump will come on, and it's it's like a three okay. foot deep basin, and it will pump all the water outside. So uh, kind of like a bilge surprise. pump on a boat yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's definitely not something I had to deal with as a kid. Yeah. And it was all always full of water, so I always figured that reflection in the water, the hole to hell had. You know, oh had my to gosh! You crazy gnome troll witch lady. La troll lady trying to pull you yeah. into gross basement water and the, the one of the last times it ever happened with her anyway when i was being pulled downstairs 
I remember somehow being able to free my arms a little bit to where I could grab the walls and not be dragged freely downstairs. And I said, cast all or cast away all evil spirits in the name of, and then this presence came down on my face and on my chest. And, you know, that name does not work on me. You know, freak me out. And as soon as I got to the name Jesus Christ, it tried to stop me from saying it. But once I even thought Jesus Christ, it went away. And so. Oh, my gosh. The, the... <laughs> I, the worst worst one I've had is as a Christian, I was sleeping in a spare bedroom. I might have been detoxing from pain meds or something. So I slept in the spare bedroom so I didn't bother my wife while I moved my legs all night, you know, restless leg syndrome. And I fell asleep, and I heard this high-pitched whine, some frequency getting louder and louder. And then the wall in the room seemed to dissolve into some other dimension, some other place. And it was starting to draw me through the wall. And I remember the louder this squeal got, the more powerful I felt like something was in the air. And then I felt like I was actually breathing in the heat, like over a barbecue. And every time I breathed it in, it made me feel like, you know, nitrous oxide. I don't know if you've ever done whippets or, you know, you get laughing gas. Sure, sure. Dennis, Dennis, happy gas. Well, I felt like I was breathing that in. And the temperature of it was just so hot. I just knew there was something there. And I finally, I got out of it enough where I had been able to scream for my wife. And she came into the room and I was like, you need to call an ambulance. I'm dying. And, you know, and I could just see her pacing back and forth like, are you serious? Oh my gosh. So then I saw the glow on her phone and she lifts it up to her head and she walks out of the room. And then she, I'm expecting to hear her go to the bathroom and, and hear the toilet flush as she's calling the ambulance. Well, I never hear her voice. I never hear her in the bathroom. So as I'm praying in Jesus' name, please help me get up. Please help me. I finally got up to my feet and was actually dragging myself down the hallway. And I got to our room and I, was, I figured I would just call my pastor friend, Carl, to come get me and take me to the hospital so we didn't have to wake up the kids. And then I got to the bedroom, and I was like, did you call the paramedics yet? And she freaked out. She sat up. She's like, why? What's going on? I was like, I just talked to you. What? I told you to call the paramedics. And she said, Sean, I have not gotten out of this bed. I have been sound asleep. So whatever I saw was fooling me into thinking that everything was being taken oh, care of. Oh my goodness. And at, Just a fake point, out. Yep. At that point I realized it was sleep paralysis and I just broke down and started crying right there. And my wife was crying with me cause she knew she's never had it, but she knew how terrifying this thing could get. And we were praying and, you know, I just, just thank God that I was out of it. And that was pretty much the last one. That was probably six years ago. And I think that goes away as my knowledge of the truth has gotten clearer, more intense. Like me understanding the word, his, his word, his life, his light, his, who he is to me and who I am in him. It's like the more, you know. I've had, you know, am I Arminianism? Am I Calvinist? Oh, gosh, I hate those Calvinists. Their points are, you know, you're either this or you're nothing. It's like, oh, I hated those. And so, But it actually caused me to examine, you know, why I believe what I believe. And then it was like a light came on. And I haven't had those kind of sleep paralysis. I mean, I've had them start to come on. And when they started to come on, all I said was, thank you for having mercy on me, Jesus. And that was enough to make it stop. Wow. At least the last five times it's tried. I just, I didn't even try to cast anything away. You know, the Bible doesn't say cast that out and, you know, bring it out, ask it its name. It doesn't say that in the Bible. Mm. It says he's had mercy on us. And so that's what I've done is just a thank you for, just thank you for your mercy on me. And sleep paralysis would just go away. Wow, that is so powerful, man. I'm telling you because... uh, 
kind of like you're saying, I mean, there's so much talk of, you know, denominationalism and, and, and you yeah. know, demonology and, and exorcism and all this stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of taking authority and things like that. And that's that's great. You know, I, there certainly is power to be yeah. um, to be had and to be used and given to us by God and and gifts and things like that. But when it really comes down to it, the easiest the the beauty of Christianity or the I you know, a lot of times I I like to remind myself that, you know, Jesus, Christianity as a culture and as a human construct, you know, is one is great. Uh, it certainly has its flaws. Um, but just Jesus, you know, just the, the sacrifice that Jesus made himself. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> the divinity and sacrifice of Jesus. I mean, that's enough. There doesn't right. have to be anything else. And that it's. I love to hear you say that part of your story because it really is past every detail that we could squabble about and people have spent thousands of years arguing about. Yeah. Past all that is just the simple grace and mercy of Christ's uh, sacrifice yeah. uh, and and mercy on us. I mean, that's <laughs> at least in your case study is the most yeah. powerful and quickest way to, um, you know, uh, to, to not being scared. Yeah. To, <laughs> to not being scared and to, to be left alone <laughs> from the yeah. enemy. And, and, uh, you know, that has more power than any, you know, regimented prayer that's been made up over the years. Yeah. In fact, I mean, I've gone through all that, that Christian hocus pocus and, I've gone through just some stuff that just seemed to actually give demons more power. Cause if I'm trying to talk to them, if I'm, if I'm even communicating with them, like they have the authority to be there at all, I've already lost. Right. I, that and, is such a great point. My goodness. And I started listening to uh Russ Dizdar and uh, you know, shatter the darkness and, and I probably wasn't mature enough spiritually or emotionally to be listening to a lot of that sure and uh because i was finding the stuff all around my eyes were being open but i was i was i was intellectually past my emotional and spiritual capabilities because i was waking up to the stuff and you know i was looking under every every chair at the church looking to see if a witch left a charm or trying to figure out <laughs> right, right. which one came to the church to get next to the pastor. And Hey, that one wants to get on the children's ministry. And it's like, ah, oh, I was going crazy. But at some point I had to, you know, figure out why I believe what I believe. And I'm glad, you know, stuff that I learned from rusted star, it actually, it actually helped. And unfortunately a lot of that stuff is so real and it's really going in like Satan really does go into the church and, you know, he wants to be on the worship team and get them, you know, following what the people think are worshiping Jesus. And he could be, you know, worshiping dark Lord or whatever, when he says, Lord, sure. And, you know, I'm sure all that stuff, I'm sure all that stuff's real. And as I started getting into some of the Masonic stuff and, you know, my wife showed me, you know, her mom has this plate that has a Masonic emblem on it. And I was like, oh, no, it's in our family, you know. And it had the, the, the Order of the Eastern Star on it. Right. Which, by the way, do you remember when you were in Dublin, the Prophecy Conference, you drove through Plain City and you took a picture of that Masonic Lodge? Yes. Yes, I do. I, it's on our Instagram. I live one block away from that. And yeah. so. You mentioned that. That's crazy. Yeah. And I started looking for the underground thing in Plain City. Like this was just, it looks like a Christian community on the outside, but I knew there was some sinister thing going on inside. And I started pointing out how, like I, I got really paranoid for a while because I knew somebody was following me. You know, as I'm researching stuff and whatever's on my Google history and you know, I'm Illuminati and whatever. Yeah, definitely. You know, looking at i knew i probably threw up some red flags but i actually started having people following me and to the point where i had two of the same cars following me and i tried to get off of a um, off ramp and then the one got off behind me and then the other one got on in front of me 
or got off in front of me. And so then I hopped back on the freeway and only one of them was able to get back onto the freeway with me. And I started looking into this stuff and it's called gang stalking. And uh, what they end up doing is they use something familiar to you. Like my brother had a, a silver Pacifica. Well, those two cars that did that were silver Pacificas. It was like it, they were placed there on purpose to make me see them because it's something I'm familiar with. Interesting. And it's to deter whatever behavior that's going anti-establishment or whatever. You know, it's it was actually used in the 70s, and there was a case in Chicago that made it illegal to do that, but they still do it. And... uh I started, you know, even if it's only 5% of which you think people are following you is real. That's still 5% too much. Yeah. But they, do, they do that so that you start to think everyone else is following you too. And I even had someone take a picture of me at a stop sign, like went to the stop sign, unmarked utility truck. The guy got out of his truck, walked over to the front of his hood and I'm looking over waiting to see if I can go and he took a picture of me and wow. I'm like I just like threw up my arms just, seriously because I just told my brother they're following me right now oh my and gosh I, I was like, seriously so once I got in to this stuff deep enough to understand what it was then I understood okay I'll change my behavior I won't be I won't be trying to out the underground here in Plain City very much yeah that's dangerous man that's, you know, <laughs> as much online stuff as there are, you know, people tracking down things and exposing different things and, you know, but when you really start poking your nose in things, I mean, you got to be careful. Yeah. And my pastor, he thought I was a nut at first, my pastor friend. But then I started being able to just point a finger of when a car was going to pull up just to make sure we were where we normally were. And sure enough, you know, he started being able to see it. And he used, to, I don't want to say too much about him as he's the pastor of the church, but, sure. you know, as my best friend, he came to know that I wasn't crazy, that, you know, both spiritually and physically, there were these things going on that, you know, it's all, it's all like Ephesians 6 says, you know, it's not flesh and blood that we battle with. It's the spiritual powers and principalities and but they lead people to do certain things. And when I was able to show him that, yeah, it's almost like we get watched for looking into things more than we should. And you know, me leave, living right next to that Masonic Lodge, and I always said I was going to go in and ask if I could be a Mason and you know, just try to get in as far as I could to find out what's going on and then expose them. And yeah, well, there's there's a good way to get yeah. disappeared. Yeah, and well, <laughs> it tur it turns out they probably would have accepted me because my grandfather died, and I came to find out that my grandmother, the one who, I mean, she would have she had dementia and she would see demons and she'd see dead people and right before she died and. You know, my, my, my dad and his sisters, you know, it, it kind of freaked everybody out, but you know, she was nice grandma for the most part, but all of a sudden she would see things and act out things that just weren't, weren't cool. And she was from the order of the Eastern star. And yeah. I found this out well after I was already doing what I was doing. I had no idea that I had Masonic ties and that might've been what all this is about. Like in the, in the line of names, my name would be next to become a Mason because my grandfather was a Mason. It turns out, I didn't know any of this stuff. Wow. And since my dad was gay, they disowned him. Like they didn't want that and the Masonic order or something. I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I just know they disowned him. And so that's where the Masonic chain stopped unless it went from, unless it went to one of the other ants that I had, but I've never seen any proof of it anywhere beyond there. But it's like, that goes to show that, yeah, maybe I could have got in. Like I was next in the list of, you know, yeah, you're supposed to be a Mason. We've got a, we've got a life laid out for you. And Wow. That's, okay. that's I mean, that, that does do a lot of explaining, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, that, that right there is a, is a pretty good thing to trace back to, 
you know, a lot of the spiritual stuff going on in your life, man. Yeah, definitely. It's, I didn't want to say, oh, it's a generational curse. You know, sure, sure. Like, well, you know, it's, it's, it that's the, pretty generational. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I respect that. <laughs> Wanting to, uh, you know, maybe uh, use more than the taglines. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's fascinating, man. So, I mean, you've, uh, you know, usually I, this is kind of where we get into talking about the different conspiracies and things like that. But it kind of seems like you you've just been kind of living in it a little bit. Yeah, and then do you want me to bring up the movie I that it's always brought up on your podcast? <laughs> Go ahead. It's, it needs to make it on here. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. actually I'm just paying. I'm just paying everybody to advertise Gonza's movie, and I get a yeah, cut. Well, I'm gonna- I'm going to try not to say it <laughs> throughout the whole podcast. So I haven't said it yet. But... Well, you've been doing it pretty good. So I, I assume that that movie had a had an impact <laughs> on you and well, uh, connected a lot of dots. There were some dots connected, that's for sure. That's good. And, and, and was, just, it... just to be fair, I <laughs> – <laughs> He's talking about my uh, my co-host in Canary Cry Radio and Canary Cry News. Gon Shimura has a wildly successful film on YouTube uh, that is very very good. It's called The Age of Deceit. And if you need some dots connected between the spiritual and the physical and the yeah. conspiracies and the Bible prophecy, it, it's I would say it's the number one film to watch. And how has he never made Gone? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Like, how did they even make it out to YouTube? And like, it's the only reason it could it it's still on there is because they think if they leave it on there, people won't put any faith in it. Yeah, I, that that has to be something about it. You know, it, it's interesting. And and he made that film, and it's been out. Um, and it, it, it's been out longer than it, it came out before they started kind of regulating that. I have a feeling if he tried to like put up another one it would be uh, filtered out somehow but anyways i think it's the orwellian and the huxleyan thing Uh uh-huh we're we're given our antidepressants and told be quiet go back to sleep but then again you know if if we're you know if we're waking up a little bit and want to know something they say oh no here's all the information you could possibly need so you're just so cluttered you can't find the truth yeah exactly that's absolutely true I think both are in play there. Yeah. Um, but my kids, I was able to show my kids that movie. And at first it put them to sleep, but well, now <laughs> I've, got, I've got one 24 and got one that's going to be 22 in, in December. And they have both gone the wild way, just like that pastor said. And, you know, they had never seen me so much as even buzzed. So when I shared my testimony with them and, you know, told them what brought me back here and how, how, it, was to, how it was to be with them. And, oh, that's another thing I didn't tell you. Uh, in my pact with the devil, when I said I wanted whoever my ex was with to die, mm-hmm. I found out, like, within a week that one of the people in her lives hung himself. Oh, wow. So, and then... Now, this is what my kids have told me. Another one actually put, I guess, a shotgun to his mouth, and, and he actually lived through it. So she was on the other side of this spiritual thing. And, you know, my the, that pastor in Florida, I was like, you know, should I go to a psychiatrist? I was like, no, because they'll put you on medication to deaden, you know, your memory of this and to deaden your, your eyes being opened. And so I never did, you know, seek professional help just you know eventually had enough pastors and church people tell me you know what you might not be crazy you know yeah maybe you know maybe there's there is some truth to this and then with the help of like age of deceit you know have a a little bit behind what i was saying and then if anybody could handle you know johnny iron and (laughs) go that way and i'll tell you what man i feel like a cross between him and what's the guy's name chuck is that who was just on that that, uh yeah salt yep there was yeah chuck yes it was either chuck or uh or omar i think chuck was the the salt guy yeah i I can't remember sorry sorry chuck and omar 
yeah, I almost I almost listened to it again just to see because I feel like I'm a cross between Johnny Iron and and that guy <laughs> that sweated salt because I definitely had some things prayed out of me and it's, it's kind of like they prayed out just enough and then it you know gets sucked right back on me until I actually had enough faith on my own in the truth that you know just 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 God's mercy on me and those things have no power and yeah all that stuff's going around people really are watching you people you know are having these experiences on drugs which I'm sure they're real I don't think they're just hallucinations but with all that stuff that's still going on the only thing that really it's, it's like being in the deep end constantly only you're observing the deep end from the diving board and you can turn around and walk away from the pool at any point mm. just based on your knowledge of Christ and your your faith in him it's like you can turn around and walk away from that deep end and sometimes you still want to look in and see what's going on but you also need to you know walk back away from the deep end and cling to Christ just to just to get some just to get level headed again. Yeah, and, man. And get crazy Jesus on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you no, know, you you make an excellent point, man. Well, I I, I mean, I got to say the, the experiences and the stories that you've told in this podcast are just out of control. I mean, some of some of the most wild things and it, but it seems like you've uh You've come a long way since then, man. How how are you doing yeah. nowadays? Well, Satan was never allowed to use my my musical gift for him, even though I signed on for it. After my uh, pastor said my soul was never mine to sell, um, I, I I was going to go fast at a cabin, and I was bringing a guitar and a microphone, a keyboard, a Bible, some tuna, some uh, cheese, and some crackers. I'm just kind of fast for the weekend and write some music and put it down. I had a little Bose tabletop system. And uh, the guy that let me borrow that was probably one of the pivotal points in my Christianity because I went to this cabin and I just prayed. I read his word. I wrote these songs. And it's, you know, even now, it's like the songs that I was writing was actually his answer to me later on in my Christian walk. Mm. Like I can, I can listen to one of my songs and it's like, that's what, that's, he, he told me the answer to this part of my life right here in the song. Wow, you know? that's amazing. It is. And um, it turned into a nine day thing because there was a thunderstorm that, shook the cabin so hard and raised the creek. I drove through a creek in a Jeep to get up to this cabin. And after the storm, the creek rose about four feet and it was fast moving. So I couldn't drive my Jeep go back, back across it. So it turned into a nine day fast of writing music. And I came out of that with nine songs, written keyboards, guitar, guitar, solo, um, my, my vocals and background vocals. And I even had a song called Psalm 69 where I was just asking God, please, you know, I'm in deep water, <laughs> literally, because I couldn't get out of that place. And I was really just reflecting on all the stuff in my life and just how, man, David, if he had an electric guitar, man, he probably would have <laughs> He would <rocked>. shred. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, maybe he did on whatever he played. Maybe that's why, you know. <laughs> right dude calmed down every time he played for him it's like he probably rocked <laughs> but my music turned out to be somewhere in between pink floyd uh and metallica probably and uh and maybe even some of the old 60s love music but uh that was kind of pivotal when i came back my my pastor friend he's like Carl was like, you know, some, something changed when you were down there. And I thought, yeah, I have a shave or shower for nine days. <laughs> and listen to this music I wrote. Is this cool? And they're like, he's like, wow, man, something really happened to you. You, know, you dig into this a little more. And I did. I just kept digging and, you know, went through the rest distar fade, just trying to purge myself of all the evil that was still in me and still trying to deceive me, you know, all of that at work in my life. And, you know, just just getting involved and 
uh, started having coffee every night or every Monday night at McDonald's with him. And then it turned into a few other people until Monday night coffee is like, the cops expect us to be there. You know, that's how regular we are. <laughs> and uh, every Wednesday night we had a men's group that met at a friend's house. And that's where the kitty came home with me. And it got so big that we ended up, um, we ended up taking it to a place called the bottoms. It's on the West side of Columbus and it's, people strung out on drugs, homeless, you know, really needing help. They're really needing the truth. You know, it's like we can give them a sandwich and a tent, you know, which we do. But, you know, the word in them is the thing that really wakes them up and helps them get out of their position. And it's really awesome to watch. And, uh, and oh, that's amazing. So you're kind of got a whole ministry thing given back now. Oh, man, it's awesome. And then Thursday nights, we have our home groups. That's the co-ed where, you know, oh, gosh, I almost said it. There are some things in the men's group <laughs> that you can say that you just can't say <laughs> in a home group. And, you know, it never fails. I'm the one who says something that gets everybody laughing. And <laughs> like, I want to sh share one real quick. There was a men's group where this guy was talking about this woman that was out preaching on the street and he was like, he was on her side and he was like, men created men or God created men and women the same. And there was a silence and that was, that was my spot. That's where I needed to jump in and say something. And I didn't. And so, you know, it was tense in the men's group. I mean, we've, you know, cops have come before people to leave with a black eye. I mean, there's a, <laughs> what? it's a men's group. Yeah. We had one guy, went outside and yelled, you know, we're having an effing Bible study in here. You know, <laughs> quit it. You know, and the last night the cops came. I mean, oh you know, some, cops you know, getting called to the Bible study. <laughs> yeah. We're pretty known for that. And now, you know, now we're at a place where they hand out Narcan so that you can, you know, stop someone from ODing on heroin. Oh yeah, sure. And, but, uh, <laughs> I had my spot to say, you know, men and women were not created the same. And it was a real tense Bible study. And apparently he, he said it again. And, you know, men and women were created the same. And, and this, you know, nobody said anything. And, and it was just tense. And he, he could did it a third time. And he's like, men and women are created the same. So I finally yelled out. I'm like, no. You know, I have a, you know, and then you fell in the blank. Oh, and <laughs> And that that just turned the tide of our men's group forever. <laughs> oh, Sean. Now it's an anything goes, and you know, as long as we're trying to you know point people to Jesus and come to understand the Word, my little my little descriptive, you know, I, I say the things that no one else will say yeah. at the right time, and sometimes it's hilarious. But some people who wouldn't know me would think, oh. I mean, he's not a Christian. Yeah, I mean, yeah. certainly there. <laughs> I can think of a, a certain group of people who'd not be uh, too thrilled to hear that. But it sounds like you kind of got kind of a wild uh, anything goes type of Bible study there. But it sounds yeah. really authentic in its uh, search it for is. Christ and everything like that. I I it imagine is. actually now that I'm out now that I'm thinking about it, I imagine that. Uh, a lot more guys would go to a lot more men's Bible studies uh, if, you know, maybe maybe if they cut loose a little bit. Yeah. I mean, try to keep it clean, but, yeah, you know. You do your best. Some, there's people who's just starting. Yeah. You know, and, and thinking that we're a bunch of clean Christians and we've got it all together and – if people would just be real and say, no, I'm screwed up. I, you know, I don't know, you know, you know, don't follow me, follow Jesus. Cause I'm right. sure I've got it messed up. You know, I'm just here to say, look over there, there's Jesus, you know? Yeah. You know, and there's something just so attractive about that authenticness, you know, that authenticity, um, where you're not trying to be the, the nice buttoned up Christian that you're supposed to be, but you are, authentic in who you are and who you are is somebody trying their best to do what uh what christ wants yeah i want to be that you know perfect church person but i don't 
I don't know if God has time to do that in my life before I die. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, to, to, to a certain extent, I mean, that's the, the more biblical description, you know? Yeah, we oh. got to try to we gotta try to head that way. I mean, obedience is a natural response to his grace, and obedience doesn't come easy because we're taught to fight it ever since we could say, no, you know? <laughs> right, right. And I mean— and luckily, even as a Christian, I wasn't shunned. And through some of my surgeries, I got, you know, a pain pill problem. And I'm normally way more medicated than I am right now. I haven't had any of my pain medicine in days. Yeah. But uh, there, were, there were times in other surgeries I would take, you know, 6 to 12 Perk 30s in a day. Ooh, that's a, that's a, lot, of, that's a lot of Percocet. Yeah. Yeah, I'd go through, when I was prescribed 10 milligram ones, I'd go through 120 of them in four days. Ooh. And yeah, I mean, you would think that would kill most people, but I got to the point to where I knew I had to just go through withdrawal, not get on the, the Suboxins or anything like that. I just had to do it so that I could speak to it, to the men that are coming to the Bible study. I, I had to do it. And I went through the worst withdrawal I've ever been through. And uh, I did it as a Christian and I had people supporting me through it, praying with me and, you know, really helping me. And, and you know, I wasn't shunned afterwards. I was just open, like, look, I'm struggling. I can get hooked on these things just the same as anybody else, Christian or not Christian. You know, there are stuff that is meant to help us but, you know, overdoing it causes a really negative reaction. In fact, it even put a veil between me and God. You know, it, it got to a point, you know, men's Bible study, Monday night coffee, a Thursday night home group, a Sunday morning on the worship team, uh, which, by the way, that's one thing that changed after I came back from the woods. The pastor's wife signed me up for the worship team. I didn't even know I was on the worship team. And then they say, hey, you got to show up here to you know, I did, and they're like, hey, you play your guitar, and it's like, hey, yeah, now you're on the worship team. It's like, what? I didn't notice that happened, but that's God starting to use the things that I wanted to use before, not for evil, just so I, you know, I just wanted to be a rock star or something. Yeah. He ended up using it in a way better way to where I could praise him, and and I'm in a worship, ah, it's just, I, mean, I, could, I could just go in all different directions about all the things that he's done in my life that I would have never, th I mean, when I used to go big or go home, you know, taking drugs and skydiving, and all, he's gone big or gone home in my Christian life. And he does, he goes big. I mean, we had a guy from our men's group. God, I hope I don't cry over this one. Cause Johnny, if you're listening, oh, I, but, uh, <laughs> he, he, he was, he was like a real knockout guy. Like, uh, you know, there'd be 10 guys that you didn't want to cross you know, on the west side of Columbus at night. And, you know, he'd look next to him and have maybe one or two guys with him. And he'd go, oh, okay. And then he'd just run and jump on them and, you know, and start beating on them. What? Just to, <laughs> this guy, this guy was that, like, he had just trained for nothing else other than to survive on the west side of Columbus. And, uh, he wasn't even like a super drug, a drug head or anything like that. He just, he just smoked a lot of dope and got in a lot of fights and uh, tried to get with the girls. I mean, that was his life. And at men's group, I started picking them up. And every time I went to pick them up, there were gunshots and an ambulance and somebody getting shot right there on the street. Wow. And I was just like, hey, man, instead of me coming and pick you, picking you up, me and my wife had talked about this. This is another, you know, my wife is just, she's she's just such a blessing he said hey i said i me picking you up why don't you just come stay with us that way you're within walking distance of work you know you can get to these bible studies and stuff and till we can get your license because we didn't want him driving because he didn't have a license and we didn't just want him to keep going you know in a path he couldn't dig himself out of and he actually dropped his entire life and came and moved to our house and became a christian hardcore went exactly 180 i mean he went from you know fighting and smoking dope to smoking dope kind of lasted a little while a couple months but 
and he even dropped that and gave his testimony and then you know got a job as an electrician you know got his license back and then he started going to the west side and doing stuff for the homeless people and it's like man to watch to watch it turn around like that you know god, wow. doesn't, let, god doesn't let everybody see that yeah that's and, amazing and to think that puny little old did too much drugs in my life me <laughs> had any you know had any part in it you know i look it's my wife my wife let all this happen my i'm just up for the late nights and say hey let's go find jesus you know and my wife's like going to work while i'm all laid up after surgeries you know it's like it has been a wild ride he's not the only one we have seen turn around i mean there was another guy on heroin for 30 years and he got off a of heroin, got himself a place, got him a car, and then ended up, you know, working for the city. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is the turnaround that God can do so quickly. And when it lasts, when it when it goes through the storm and comes out the other side, and they're still Christian, but they're they're the Christians now that are like, yeah, life's hard. I'm just trying to be a Christian. They're real Christians, you know. Yeah. You know, they the when the honeymoon's over. The real Christians are still there to say, I'm struggling. This is hard, but I'm still a Christian. You know, help me through this, guys. And then the other ones are the ones that, you know, pretend that, you know, they make the pretty shell, but they're rotting inside because they're not transparent, you know. But it is just the, the life changes that we've been able to see is just it's phenomenal. And I know I have to be one of those phenomenal life changes that these people watched happen because i had to comment we, sh we share praises at the beginning of church and i could never carry a thought long enough to finish my praise without changing it into something else and <laughs> i guess after about 10 years one of the one of the smart people in the church said you know sean's kind of getting coherent we understand exactly what he's praising god for you know? so <laughs> i've woken up a little bit <laughs> Wow, well, that's amazing, man. You know, I got to say, at the beginning of this conversation, you were telling me that God told you to stop being a professional skydiver. And I was thinking, oh, that's weird. That's That doesn't seem quite right. <laughs> but now I'm realizing that if that didn't happen, I mean, there's uh, so much more good has come from <laughs> you quitting skydiving oh, yeah. than anything else. So I, I take back, I repent from that. <laughs> oh and kids oh my gosh we've had kids tell us that we're more parent more of a parent than mm. their parents i hate to i mean to even say that out loud makes me cringe but yeah, yeah well. I, I mean no disrespect to parents parenting's hard you know mm. i'm pray, pray god i don't screw up my kids and we used to do a saturday night thing called the cove and because of Gans's movie, I would try to make these movies that would appeal to all the kids that were high and then get them so interested and get them all freaked out on a video and then, you know, splice <laughs> Christ in there just right. And there were a lot of kids. There's, let's see, there's one in jail now that I know is a Christian. And he just, unfortunately, just, he had a hard time not drinking. Yeah. 18, 18 years old. He was even going to live with us. Uh, but ended up getting taken too soon. But I know in jail he clings to Christ, and my front porch has been a has been a place where there's been 15 people meeting there for a Bible study to you know just me and the pastor sitting there. You know, I call him Carl because that's he's not just the pastor; he's my best friend. You know, yeah. And I got these other friends that hover around that are just they're amazing friends. I never thought for. All the friends that I would die with, you know, I'd die for you. Oh, yeah, you'll die for me. That's a bunch of crap. No, we wouldn't have. We're selfish beings. <laughs> and, and now I live amongst true Christian people that openly put their lives out there to help your life when your life is in need. And that is just so amazing to go from just hanging out on a front porch to seeing someone in your life that God has moved to show himself through them. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. But wow. the kid, the kids ministry that even, you know, that morphed into, there's quite a few kids that 
have, have claimed Christ. And we've got a couple that are still coming to our church. We have one that's coming back to our church. You know, it's, it's really, it's really been a wild experience. And I've just shared my story with them. And they just thought, you know, oh, I under- Carl was sitting there and I was talking about one of my mushroom things. And what I had done is walked up to these group of kids and was like, I see you in there. Like I was just letting them know, I know, I know you're high. I was like, see you and <laughs> freaking them out. And, right. and Carl, the pastor was watching me talk to them and, you know, he'd start to talk to them about Christ. And then I'd start to talk to them about mushrooms and how <laughs> I found Christ, you know, due to the fact that I went to the end of the other side and, and it was false. And now I came back from the other side and now I found Christ and, one of them just looked at the at Carl and he's like, no, you have good intentions. I'm sure. And I understand, but this guy, I understand him. You know, it's like, <laughs> so even, even with the kids, it's been a wild ride. Wow, man. That's amazing. That is yeah. just, I mean, I gotta say, man, this is uh, really just been one of the most enjoyable uh, conversations and not just cause I don't have to talk so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and usually, you know, this is the point of the conversation where I, you know, try to maybe talk about uh, what sort of thing someone does to to, uh, you know, stay emotionally healthy and to improve their the joy in their life. But, I, you know, I think the past 10 minutes here, I think you pretty much just explained it. I think I might just let that lie unless you got something that's burning on your heart. No, oh, seek God. Just seek yeah. God in all you do. I mean, yeah. I mean, just everything. It's like my wife used to hate it. You know, we'd go to McDonald's and, you know, I'd have, talking to the cashier and I'd be like, do you know Jesus? You know? <laughs> my wife used to hate it that I'd go anywhere and just bring it up. You know, I had a girl start crying behind the counter one time because I was like, you know, you don't have to be so stressed out. Do you, do you know a name like a guy by the name of Jesus? And she, her eyes popped open because she did, you know, years prior. I'm like, he's calling you back right now. He'll give you peace. And I just prayed with her. And she bawled her eyes out. <laughs> I went back to that coffee shop one time and she pointed me out to some woman. I was like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but her mom came over and said, I really want to thank you for, you know, for helping my daughter that day. And, you know, she does know Christ. And, I was like, oh, phew. <laughs> you know, and then, and then I went back to that same coffee shop again, and they pointed me out again to this other girl that used to be my bartender. And she was like, oh, man, I, you know, I worked at the bar. I prayed for you so many times. I, I was just hoping you would come back to where you're supposed to. And sure enough, there I was praying for her niece. You know, So it was – she didn't work amazing. at the bar anymore, but it was it was cool that even while I was at the bar, I had somebody praying for me. That's amazing, man. I love that. Great. <laughs> I love Just that so much. Seek God in everything. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You know, man, I, I'm thinking, Sean, that, uh, you know, usually I try to land the plane with a couple a couple other questions. And, you know, we talked yeah. about your cat. And, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally down to talk about that stuff if you want, if you want to talk about juicing and cats. Uh, but, uh, you know. <laughs> I think I, re- I think I like this one. I think I like it how it is. Yep. It's so, been good, man. It's been real good. And, you know, I'm uh, – this anybody who's been on the show, they know that uh, a lot of times it's very last minute um, to, yeah. act, to actually jump on. But I got to say this. You're the first person to actually initiate the last minute-ness. I think we've been trying to find a – a time here for a while and uh you yeah. sent me an email today and said let's do this let's jump on tonight and actually this is the second interview i've done today and i don't think i've ever right. done two in the same day so you did a good thing man and i'm I'm just so happy that you reached out this is like full circle for me man it's yeah. like i found punk i found podcasts and found canary cry radio and oh my gosh it was on <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm seeking out all your guests and a friend of mine listened to Heiser and then Heiser ended up coming to our church and I mean it's just been ah, it's been phenomenal and now to actually talk to you yeah it's it's like okay how did I actually get in this circle it's just like <laughs> it's amazing that with a computer and 
you know, a fellow Christian that we can reach across the dome and talk each other, talk to each other. Like uh, this. <laughs> reach across the <laughs> dome. I like that. Very good. <laughs> yeah, all, yeah it's, all it really it. takes is a little bit of initiative, man. And you, you took it. You got initiative. If, if, if there's one the thing way, about you, you got that. I don't. I don't really sit on either side. By the way, flat <laughs> no. earth or round earth, so I don't care. You yeah, know, I. I could tell that about you. <laughs> I, we, we're on the same page as far as that goes. All right, that's cool. But, well, man, right, do you have anything else that you want to ask me? You know, I honestly, I, I am just so satisfied with how this has gone, um, and you know, I, I guess I'll just very simply ask. Have you tried juicing yet? You know, I almost did, but like I said, it was mushroom juice. <laughs> so, at this point, I would like to try like apple juice and carrot juice. <laughs> and we've almost got a juicer, but you know, we just we haven't committed. So, <laughs> got a blender. <laughs> well, there you go, blend, blend. That's a good start. Now Although you now you got to put some veggies in the blender. It's it's uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that tastes nasty. That's what the juicer's for. <laughs> well, Sean, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is truly, truly a pleasure, and I know everybody listening is just going to be so blessed. Oh man, thank you so much. I'm just I'm. You have blessed my life so much. God has used you guys just phenomenally in my life to help me not feel crazy, and. I'm, I'm the, the joy spiracy. That is so true. When your eyes are so open, you need to come back to something like this, where you can just you can talk about your faith, you know, about your life, and not be so like, oh my gosh, look, there's another demon in that side of the government. You know, <laughs> it is it is so cool what you're doing here, and I appreciate it so much. Well, amen, brother. Thank you, and praise God. And uh, you know yes, what? Praise God. You know what? Uh, now, j just real quick, just in case, do you do any? Uh, do you do a lot of Facebooking or have a blog or anything that we want to plug here? You know what? I just started a Facebook page to be able to talk to somebody on Instagram. I was one of those anti Facebookers. <laughs> sure. And now, man, I got my face out there, and my kids are poking me, and all these people I don't even know are poking me, and I got to figure out how to make it a little more private. Okay. But, so we you want to go to Blue Jewel, B L U J U L. Say something that I can understand, and I will friend you and talk to you. But if you're just another poker, nah. <laughs> poker. <laughs> Reach out with a real, true uh, human contact. Yeah, and maybe down to earth. <laughs> All right, man. Well, there All you right. go. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, man. And uh, yes. you know what? We're gonna keep in contact. All right. All right. That's cool. I have a shot part two. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe we'll do a, a bonus. Let's do a bonus <laughs> a episode. We'll throw it All up right, on cool, the Patreon. Man. All right, man. All right, cool, brother. Will All you right. take it easy and get some sleep? It's late over there. Yeah, it definitely is. Be blessed, man. All right, take it easy, brother. Thank you, brother. Bye-bye. Did you like that? Did you like that, my friends? I certainly did. That was uh, just just a really a wild ride. And, um, man, just what a great guy. Anyhow, uh, now you guys know. Now you guys know what it's like to uh, skydive on 12 hits of ecstasy and, uh, you know, have a deal with the devil and, and uh, ultimately find just an incredibly an incredible story of redemption and, and leading others uh to a better place in their lives and in their walks with god so all right thank you so much sean and um yeah i think i think uh later on we might try to do a bonus episode with him so if you enjoy sean and more of his stories and insight into uh just the wonderful and weird things of the world uh, you can go over to patreon.com and thank you all who are supporting the Patreon. It is just means so much to me that you do. And if you are looking for a, a way to support this podcast financially, you can go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the Joyspiracy Theory. And you can sign up to support uh, on a monthly basis. 
And that is just such a fantastic way to uh, keep the show going and let me know that I'm doing something right. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I get it. Finances, that's, that's, this is a hard thing to deal with. It's got to, it's a, maybe you got to fear commitment. You don't want to sign up for a month to month thing. Well, another way you can just uh, help so much with the podcast is if you just share this on your social network. Tell some friends face to face. Text them the link. Do whatever you got to do. Tell them about the podcast because this is certainly one that a lot of people need to hear head on over to the facebook page facebook.com slash the joy spiracy theory like that page leave an itunes review uh you can or any anywhere on your podcatchers however you're listening to this go ahead and leave a rating and a review a rating is one to five stars uh one star is you took a bunch of ecstasy and jumped out of a plane and you didn't have a parachute and five is you took a bunch of ecstasy uh jumped out of an airplane had a parachute, uh, survived, found God, uh, stopped parachuting, and then uh, got a chance to tell all that story on the Joyce Pearson Theory. Uh, and that would be five stars. And a review is just telling people <laughs> that that story. Uh, I don't know if you can fit it in there. But anyways, thanks everybody for listening to the Joyce Pearson Theory. Make sure to tune in next time. But until then, jump out of planes without ecstasy. It's fun. <laughs>